The creatures around here are dangerous. None more than this bully mong named Knuckle Dragger. Kill everyone I know. Anywho, I keep a pistol in the cabinet over there for emergencies. But in here, we should be pretty safe. Borderlands 2 has some of my favorite weapons in the franchise. They range from moderately okay to extremely powerful, and most are capable of doing some incredible things in the right hands. However, there's one weapon that often gets overlooked, overshadowed almost immediately upon getting a replacement, and that is the basic repeater. You get this weapon from completing the first quest, My First Gun, and though it may not seem like it, it's actually a unique weapon. The barrel is known as Crappy Starter in the game's code, and this gun cannot drop from any other source, only coming from this first mission. You may ask, if it's unique, what's the special effect? And the answer is simple. The gun has a 50% reduced magazine size. Yep. Its only attribute is being actively worse than a normal weapon with the exact same parts. So, what if we take this weapon and try to complete the entire game with it? Surely it's impossible, right? Well, strap in, because this is going to be one hell of a ride. And if you make it to the end, there's some bonus content in there for you. The rules for this run are fairly simple. No glitches, no bar, no shields that can deal damage, like Royd, Amp, Spike, and Nova, no melee, and no grenades to deal damage to enemies. Grenade jumps are fine though. The first thing we have to do in this game is choose our character. Now, I'm actually doing this challenge because I saw a video from Spuddy Cube for the exact same challenge, and they chose Salvador. I scoffed at the time, thinking that Salvador was clearly not the most optimal class, and so I chose Gage. Spuddy Cube had a rule in their challenge where if unintentional damage was dealt by something that wasn't the basic repeater, they'd save and quit, resetting the map. This included jump damage. I'm not quite that masochistic, since there are a lot of enemies in the game that will lodge themselves into you and force you to deal jump damage. Waking up in wind sheer waste, Claptrap brings us to his bachelor pad and promptly gets treatment from a budget ophthalmologist, and with that, we get our first and only weapon for the whole playthrough. This dull pistol has 11 hole damage of killing power and fires in a two shot burst while aiming down sights. It's not the worst, but it's certainly not great either. You might think we'll head off to fight Knuckle Dragger right away, but you'd be wrong. Instead, we head to the best early game XP farm, the fight for Sanctuary. At the very start of this DLC, Sanctuary is being invaded and you have to go through a timed section where you're fending off against invaders. After a certain amount of time, you're teleported to a different map to start the DLC proper. In this timed section, the level 30 enemies can get killed by Mordecai, who's sitting right up there above your station, and you reap the XP rewards. By saving and quitting before you get teleported, you can repeat this over and over for easy XP and some money. I did this until level 5 and stopped. Not because I wanted to though, rather because I made the biggest mistake of this playthrough. I finished the timed section. Now, the best XP farm was gone, and we'd need another way to get experience if we wanted to level up. Instead of restarting or force quitting the game without saving, I decided to live with my mistake. Level 6 is all we needed anyway to get the skill I chose this character for, Anarchy. Anarchy is a stacking skill that increases whenever you kill an enemy or reload an empty magazine in combat. Each stack grants you 1.75% gun damage at the cost of the same amount of accuracy, and will stack up to 150 times. Stacks are lost when you die or reload a magazine that isn't empty. This means, at maximum stacks, you get about 260% additional gun damage. In order to get one more level, I go to the Digistruct Peak to do this level 35 mission to open a door, which brings us to level 6. I head back to Windshear Waste and escort Claptrap to find his eye. Our damage isn't bad right now, but these are level 1 enemies. Every level in Borderlands 2, the damage of weapons, the health of yourself and enemies, and other similar stats increase by 15%. And that increase is exponential, meaning at level 9, enemies will have three times the amount of health than they would at level 1. At level 11, they'll have four times health, etc, etc. Our damage might be acceptable now, but that will definitely not last long. We encounter the first boss, 
Knuckle Dragger, who doesn't pose much of a threat, especially since we have 20 stacks of anarchy. We finish the mission and head to Liarsburg. Our damage is still fine, and it's getting better with each kill or reload. If anything, this section is actually pretty easy. We meet Sir Hammerlock, an actual ophthalmologist, and get Claptrap's eyesight fixed. We turn in the mission and take the This Town Ain't Big Enough mission, which spawns a handful of enemies in Liarsburg. More fodder for my anarchy stacks. After we clear out the enemies, we have almost a hundred stacks, enough to head forward in the story. On the way to the second boss, we get a handful more anarchy stacks, and enter the Boom Boom fight with a whopping 123 stacks of anarchy. We take out Boom and level up, but run out of ammo when fighting Boom. This is an issue that'll come up more than a few times. Until we reach Sanctuary, we can't actually upgrade our ammo capacity. I decide to put my skill into Smaller, Lighter, Faster for some more reload speed. It does reduce my magazine size by one, but that actually works in our favor since it means we'll get more anarchy per bullet. We open the gate and kill all the bandits that come through and head to Captain Flint's ship. Here's a small bit of lore for you. Captain Flint is his name. First name Captain, last name Flint. I didn't actually know that until Jolt's dude mentioned it during the Uniques Only run, and the same goes for Baron Flint. There's apparently some contradicting lore about this, saying that he got the Baron title after starting his bandit camp, but in Borderlands 2, Captain Flint says that it's his actual name. I wonder if they ever tried to write their way out of this, the same way they did with Bloodwing being sequentially protandric. Anyway, we get to this badass marauder and run out of ammo. Big shocker. I run away, looking for anywhere more ammo could be, and run into a fun glitch. When you pick up ammo with an empty gun in your hand, the game doesn't automatically reload it. You have to reload it manually. I was scared that by doing so, all of my anarchy stacks would be lost. So instead, I dropped my weapon and picked it back up. I tested it later, and it turns out you can reload your weapon just fine in this state, and it won't dump your anarchy. I died to this badass marauder and decided it'd probably be a good idea to get a few more levels. I go around, killing random bandits to get more anarchy before facing off against Boom Boom again. After killing Boom, we hit level 8, and all that's left is to kill Boom. This time, even though we're a higher level, we have significantly fewer anarchy stacks. And because of that, we run out of ammo. When you pick up a weapon in this game, it gives you ammo for that weapon. So seeing pistols was a godsend. With another level to my name, I head back to Captain Flint's ship and try again, only to die even sooner. At this point, I figure it's probably best to just run through the area and ignore as many enemies as I can. I simply don't have the ammo necessary to kill even basic enemies, so I charge forward, run out of ammo, and die. Purposefully this time, since that actually gives you a small portion of your ammo back. This issue never gets better, by the way. We may get more ammo capacity, but we'll always be struggling against our ammo, since the amount of damage this thing can do will never increase past what Anarchy can buff it by. I finally managed to defend Claptrap, and skip this section by doing this series of jumps. Claptrap doesn't break, and we head over to Captain Flint. You may be wondering, if you didn't have enough ammo to kill basic enemies, how are you going to have enough to kill an actual boss? Well, just outside of Flint's arena, there's this ammo vendor. You can trigger the boss fight and jump back to the vendor, and this is how we'll take out Flint. I lure him over to this area to make it easier to hit him, but Flint gets a little too close, and also reveals he's a siren and can phase through walls. This isn't as big of a problem as you might think. Without his adds, Flint is actually pretty easy to handle, as long as you don't get too close. The biggest issue is his fire phase, when he gets a bunch of damage reduction and gains bullet deflection. After a solid 5 minute fight, we kill the second of the Flint brothers and clear out the rest of the enemies so we can get Claptrap to his ship. We arrive in Three Horns Divide, and our first task is to get a car. It's pretty easy to accidentally damage enemies in a car, and the gun on the car isn't the basic repeater, so I decided to ban the usage of cars in this playthrough, except for when they're required to progress. We get a car and immediately exit it. This gap right here normally requires the car in order to clear it, but with a grenade jump. I said with a grenade. I said with a grenade jump, we can clear the gap very easily. Not even close. And now we begin our run to sanctuary. There is a small benefit to running instead of taking the car. We can kill enemies on the way to get anarchy. 
I lost all the anarchy I previously had when trying to get the car, so we'll need to get that back. We get to Sanctuary's gates, and they tell us we're not allowed to enter until we get a double-A battery from Corporal Reese. We hit the fast travel station for this map and run into Savage Lee, who absolutely decimates me. There goes those anarchy stacks. I was really close to level 9, so I wanted to kill Savage Lee badly. We respawn and get our revenge, using the level up bonus for a couple more kills on the surrounding bully mongs. We try to find Corporal Reese, but instead find out that he traded a double A battery to a discount massage parlor for their services. I don't think these guys are licensed. After killing the murderous masseuses, Reese says he's too tired to help us get the battery back and takes a nap. We kill this one guy who's completely unrelated, and he just so happens to have the same battery we need. Roland welcomes us to his No Girls Allowed club, and gets kidnapped while doing so. With this, we're now allowed to enter Sanctuary. Finally. Apparently that AA battery was really important, as it powers the entire defense system of the city, and nobody on this planet has ever heard of a generator. We meet Scooter, the second best character in the entire franchise, and he tells us to install these fuel cells, and gives us some iridium. Iridium will be extremely valuable to us, as this is the currency which will allow us to buy ammo capacity upgrades. We immediately buy two pistol upgrades, doubling our ammo capacity from 200 to 400. The other main reason we've wanted to get to Sanctuary which I've kept secret until now, is Marcus. He gives us a mission called Rock Paper Genocide, which is supposed to teach the player about the different elemental effects and how they work against different types of health. But, more importantly for us, it spawns this enemy. As long as you don't actually deal the correct kind of elemental damage, the enemy will continually respawn, allowing you to kill him over and over and over again. This doesn't yield much experience, but it does give a consistent way to get anarchy stacks. In the future, if you ever see me with max stacks, assume it's because I sat here for about 10 minutes killing this vandal. However, instead of doing that right now, I need to get more experience. While I may have borked the Fight for Sanctuary mission, there was another power leveling method I could use. We head to the Raid on Digistruct Peak and start the History of Simulated Violence mission. We have absolutely no chance at killing these gags normally, but we can lure them to this edge, bait them into attacking us, and watch them fall to their deaths. This doesn't give us a bunch of XP, but sometimes the game will spawn a rabid skag, which yields about 10 times as much XP. One thing I had to learn about the hard way was that the knockback skags could deal was enough to push you off the ledge if you're not careful. This happened to me more times than I'd like to admit and more times than I can even show, as I stopped recording these sessions of XP farming after a while. Seriously, I have 500 gigabytes of footage right now, but if I had recorded all of the farming, that would have easily taken up terabytes. I farm all the way to level 14, and allocate points into close enough, a skill which allows shots that miss to ricochet to the nearest enemy and deal reduced damage. This works great with anarchy as you can imagine. Since we're doing an insane amount of gun damage at the cost of our accuracy, I head back to Sanctuary, get max anarchy stacks, then proceed into Frostburn Canyon. Even with max anarchy, we're only dealing somewhat okay damage. I didn't quite realize it at the time, but fighting enemies was the exact opposite of what I should have been doing. Since my goal wasn't to kill enemies, it was to progress the story. Every enemy I tried to kill was one more chance to die and lose all of my anarchy stacks. And that's exactly what happens. At this point, it dawns on me that I don't actually have to kill anything here and can just run through. We reach Lilith, and during this section you're supposed to fight with her to take out a few waves of enemies, but by sitting behind this transformer thing, we can just leave all of the tough work to her. I decide to shoot at the enemies to make things go just a little faster, but quickly run out of ammo and return to glaring at the enemies angrily to deal psychic damage. Lilith kills the last of the enemies and does the worst magic trick ever. It occurs to me that I'm going to need more ammo if I want to even have a chance to deal with the next sections of the game, so I hit up the slots, hoping to get some iridium. I don't get any. I give up after about 30 minutes, check the shops for any good class mods, and travel to Three Horns Valley. I spawn a car and melee it over to the gate, entering it only to honk the horn and run over to the dust. Here, we need to destroy a bunch of bandit cars, to scavenge parts, and make a look-alike to fool the bloodshots. The problem here is that the cars are armored enemies, and armor resists regular bullets, meaning our already pitiful damage just got reduced by 20%. On top of that, they're level 13, meaning we die rather easily. 
The strategy here is to wait for the expert drivers of Pandora to get stuck in a position like this, so that we can wail on them safely. Let me just say, I tried this for about 10 minutes before dying and realizing I could do with some more ammo and health. So back to the peak. I spent the next 30 minutes getting up to level 17, which I deem enough to even attempt dealing with these cars. We get a Gwen's head, a gun that's pretty similar to mine, but doesn't have shit stats. I then spend the next four minutes pelting this car from the safety of this ramp, nearly running out of ammo. When I originally watched Spuddy Cube's video, I knew this was likely a long and arduous run, but I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Even though it only took four or five minutes to kill a bandit technical, it felt like 20 minutes since there was always a risk of dying. I get the third part and get cocky, running to the next technical without employing my safe strategy. This results in a death. I save quit, resetting the area, and go grab Anarchy from Sanctuary. I've learned my lesson now, and just hang around this ramp for safety. I take down the fourth car, and the fifth spawns soon after. You may notice that my Anarchy stacks are exceeding the max of 150 now. This is because of Gage's skill pre-shrunk Cyberpunk, which increases the cap by 50 for each point allocated. At 5 points, this makes the cap 400 Anarchy stacks which increases gun damage by 700% and reduces accuracy by 700%. However, we only have two points allocated right now, making our max stacks 250. We get the final part, head back to Ellie's garage, and download a car before hoofing it back to Three Horns Valley. I spawn the car with the correct skin and melee it to the gate. I get inside, honk the horn, and meet the first real roadblock of this run. Bad Ma is a necessary kill to progress the story, but he's normally not that big of an issue. But this run, this run is anything but normal. The thing about Bad Ma that makes him tough isn't the damage he does or the amount of health he has, it's his shield. If you hit his shield, he takes no damage. You have to strafe around him or bait him into meleeing you in order to get shots off on him. I can't really get too close to him since even though I'm a higher level, he still does enough damage to be a threat. Because of this, it's no surprise we run out of ammo pretty quickly. I reluctantly run to the Happy Pig Motel to get ammo, thinking it'll cause Bad Ma to respawn and get all of his HP back. When I return, to my surprise, he is still close to death, and I try to finish the fight off. I get so close on my first attempt, but it's not enough. This gives me an idea though. If I can get back to the ammo vendor without Bad Ma respawning, that means I can go back to get ammo whenever I want. I do the mission to restore power to the motel and attempt Bad Ma again, getting careless while trying to bait out his melee. It's apparent now that this fight won't be one I can do quickly. Now make no mistake, the amount of attempts I made for Bad Ma wasn't any small number, and each attempt took upwards of 5 minutes before dying, heading back to Sanctuary, restacking my Anarchy for 10 minutes, and then going back to Bad Ma. At some point, I got bored and just started farming experience again. I got to level 20 and respect into fancy mathematics instead of pre-shrunk cyberpunk. For more survivability, I get some Anarchy stacks and attempt Bad Ma again. And yet again, I die. But this time, I'm fed up. I play it super safe abusing this high ground to manipulate him into going wherever is most beneficial for me. And about halfway through the fight, he just gets stuck. I'm no stranger to Borderlands 2 glitches, but this one threw me for a loop. In disbelief, I grab the key, lowering the bridge, and making it into Bloodshot Stronghold. I push through the stronghold valiantly. <laughs> If you thought I had any chance making it through this area normally, you are insane. We're gonna be doing a trick known as Bloodshot Skip. By doing this grenade jump here, we can get out of bounds, then carefully traverse this out of bounds collision to skip nearly this entire map. It takes a couple of tries, but I get it. Only to get to the last section of the skip, which actually requires another grenade jump. Another grenade jump, which I didn't have a grenade for. There's no way back into the map without soft locking, so I save quit. And travel back to Sanctuary to grab a grenade SDU, or two. I try the skip again, and fall into an area that soft locks me. This skip is pretty easy when you know what you're doing, but I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm just following a video tutorial I found online. Thankfully, I get it next try, and we rescue Roland only for him to immediately get kidnapped again. Princess Peach looking ass. In the Bloodshot Ramparts, we need to reach Warden, something of a mini-boss. But for us, 
it might as well be a raid boss. Running past all the enemies, we reach Warden. And I've already resigned myself to my fate. If you don't kill Warden fast enough in this fight, Roland gets taken to an area called the Friendship Gulag. I remember actually going there on my first playthrough of this game because I was only a level 9-0 and was playing on a 12-inch CRT. Regardless, I'd give it the good old college try three times actually before giving up and waiting for the Warden to escape on the barge. Believe it or not, the Gulag was not nearly as difficult as I thought it was going to be. I don't know if it's because loaders have more crit spots, or me having maximum anarchy stacks, but so long as I could get close enough to something to actually hit it, I could deal reasonable enough damage to get through this section. We kill Warden, and Roland immediately becomes the MVP, probably dealing more than double my damage and drawing aggro. That was until he got stuck inside of Warden's corpse, breaking his AI. One more thing I didn't know at the time, you don't actually need to destroy the loaders after killing Warden. You can just save and quit, and the game will mark the section as completed. I didn't do this, and instead died, spawning me back at the beginning of the map and despawning all the enemies, which also marked the section as completed. However, Roland was still stuck, and I couldn't reach him to complete the mission. I thought grenade jumping on top of Warden might let me reach him, but the collision is incredibly tall for some reason. Thankfully, saving and quitting places Roland at the very beginning of the map, and we can continue. Warden may have been easy, but every boss from here on out will only get tougher and tougher. We meet Roland back at Sanctuary, and he tells us we need to go to Tundra Express to hijack a train. We meet Mordecai, who doesn't really do anything important here, and instead, we meet the real star of this mission, Tiny Tina. We run to the nearby bandit camps to grab her damsel's badonkadonks and use them to derail the train. Now, if you thought Bad Ma was bad, friendo, you ain't seen nothing yet. I go to Sanctuary to grab a new shield and stack Anarchy, mulling over my skill trees to see if I could give myself any advantage for the upcoming fight. Let me outline a couple of issues with this fight. The first is ammo. With 500 bullets, we don't have a chance at bringing Wilhelm down. The second is survivability. I'm relying a lot on my shield right now since I don't have any way to regenerate my health. And since both Wilhelm and the ads he spawns have a shock attack, that means my shield will get shredded. And that brings me to my final point. Wilhelm spawns ads. Throughout the fight, he can knock aside these train cars, revealing loaders underneath. The type they are seems to be random, but all loaders have the previously mentioned shock attack. Wilhelm himself can also spawn surveyors that will give him and the other bots shields. I do my best, but to nobody's surprise, I die quickly. I think I might be able to solve the problem of survivability by going and getting a couple more levels. So I do that, get anarchy stacks, and return. I had a good fight going, but I accidentally press one of the side buttons on my mouse, which summons death trap. Now, I said I wouldn't restart for some accidental damage, but summoning Death Trap, that's pretty egregious. Sighing heavily, I rebind action skill to a key I'll never press, and save quick. I farm the chest next to the fast travel for a bit, and head back to Sanctuary. I notice I have just enough Iridium to get one more pistol ammo capacity upgrade, and snatch that up. I then do some testing, trying to find out which skills provide me the most benefit. Is cooking up trouble better than fancy mathematics? Could I reduce the points in pre-shrunk cyberpunk for a tangible increase to my survivability? Discord? I must have been smoking something at the time though, because I took all of the information I gained from this and flushed it down the toilet, getting blood-soaked shields and attempting the fight again. It didn't work. Then, I had another idea. Some of the DLCs in this game scale with your level, meaning they'll have enemies and items that match your current level, unaffected by whatever mission you're at in the base game. Big Game Hunt, Dragon Keep, and Fight for Sanctuary all start their scaling at level 30, but Captain Scarlet and Campaign of Carnage? They start at level 15. This means I can go to Oasis or the Badass Crater of Badassitude, and find items that are on level. As you could imagine, this was a huge realization for me. I decide to head to the Torg DLC, since there were no enemies before the nearest vendor, and buy two shields. One adaptive shield, and one booster shield. The reason I bought two is simply because I didn't know which one would be better at the time. I headed back to Sanctuary, got my Anarchy stacks, traveled to Tundra Express, made my way back to Wilhelm, and settled in for a battle of attrition. 
At first, things were looking good. I figured focusing on the shield surveyors and trying to take out the other adds was a better idea than beating his shield regeneration. I also made use of this cheese, where he spammed his Beyblade attack because we were close, but couldn't actually hit us because we were behind cover. Reminds me of someone. In the end though, we never had a chance. We simply don't have enough ammo. All this being done, I head back to the Torg DLC, looking for a shield, but not just any shield. I wanted a high capacity turtle shield with low recharge delay. I farm for 20 minutes, finding this snapping turtle shield. The delay wasn't great, but with my Calculating Anarchist class mod, it should be enough. The calculating prefix means it buffs the skill Fancy Mathematics, positively affecting our shield's recharge rate and recharge delay based on how low our health is. The lower our health, the greater the buff. I was determined. And at some point, I realized one of the biggest problems in this fight would actually become the one thing that makes it possible. In the Borderlands games, ammo drops are mostly random. That is, unless you're very low on a specific kind of ammo. Then, the game will ensure that type of ammo drops a lot more. You'll see it more in chests, ammo crates, and even from enemies. See where this is going? By allowing Wilhelm to occasionally spawn a surveyor, we can kill it and the game will almost always drop at least one pistol ammo drop. Now I'm not gonna pretend like this was easy, even with this new strategy. The beginning of the fight was still difficult. We had to kill the loaders, dodge Wilhelm, but also pay attention to him because if he spawned any surveyors, it would make the rest of the fight incredibly hard. But after we kill the loaders and make sure there are no surveyors, we can finally deal with Wilhelm. In total, the final attempt of this fight took eight minutes. We take the power core, bring it back to Sanctuary, and start the second half of the game. We cycle the ignition primers, find Roland's Iridium Goon Cave, bring Lilith some crack, and get teleported away to get a perfect view of the city flying away. At this point, I'm still numb. The hours I spent on Wilhelm still fresh in my mind. I make like Cranky Kong and take it to the fridge and run through, easily making it to the Highlands. In order to get back to Sanctuary, we need to go grab this Lunar Supply Beacon, but it's a well-known fact that Threshers find bacon delicious. It's one letter off, but who are you to judge? This fight was another one that I found surprisingly easy. You see, the game spawns a bunch of loaders, and they can actually damage the Thresher, meaning my damage wasn't really an issue. We get to overlook and place down the beacon, this is another part that you might expect to give us a lot of issues, but our shield is really tanky and there's an ammo vendor right in the middle of town. These things combined mean we just have to play a little safe and we have no troubles. The beacon didn't even become invincible. After heading back to Sanctuary, we're told we need to go to the Wildlife Exploitation Preserve. We get there, I level up, then continue running through until I get to this point. Here, we need to kill a bunch of loaders in order to get these doors to open and progress. I must have misread the instructions, because instead of doing that, I die. Now, I probably could have done this section if I gave it more than one attempt, but instead of doing that, I go do the mission The Good, The Bad, and The Mordecai. This mission rewards us with Moxie's Endowment, a relic that increases the amount of XP we receive. My hope is that it'll make farming for XP more bearable. At the end of the mission, we let Mobley and Gettle duke it out. Since this isn't UVHM, one of them actually wins, and to the victor go the spoils. And by the spoils, I mean death. Nobody wins. I win. Now, I'm gonna come clean. I did something a little less than legitimate to speed up the leveling process. There's a mod that multiplies the amount of enemies that spawn, and because I didn't feel like grinding levels for literal hours, I installed this mod and set it to the max multiplier of 25. Over the next, I don't know how long, I farmed these skags. Not for one level, or two levels, no, I farmed until level 28. Surely that's enough. I made two changes to my build. I spec'd into Cooking Up Trouble and Discord. Cooking Up Trouble gives health regen while your magazine is full, and Discord makes it so when you reload early, you don't lose all of your anarchy stacks. Instead, they're slowly consumed and you're given health regeneration, bonus fire rate, and accuracy. We only care about the health regeneration, though. 
I head back to the preserve and get back to this section. I slowly take out all of the loaders, the badass stalker, and now we have to fight the super badass loader. This fight was scary. Even with my extremely increased health and health regen, if this guy brought down my shield with his fire barrage, I could still die. On top of that, he has an insane amount of health, and I run out of ammo mid-fight. I run to the nearby ammo vendor, prepared for the possibility that when I get back he may have full health, but thankfully, he was still beaten and battered. We finish the loader off and head into the preserve proper. Normally in this section, you have to fight a bunch of skags in order to get through this next set of doors, but you can actually do a grenade jump here to go through these upper doors that don't have collision. Then do another grenade jump to fall through the ceiling of the next section. Technically, you could just get straight into Bloodwing's arena, but you also risk soft locking yourself, and I didn't want to do that. Now you might be wondering, how in the hell am I going to fight Bloodwing with minus 700% accuracy? Well, admittedly, I have no chance against Bloodwing while she's in the air, but occasionally she'll land on the ground. And if you're lucky, she'll even do her best Michael Jackson impression. We wait for her to land and just lay into her when she does. It's actually pretty easy to dodge Bloodwing's attacks while we wait for her to land. The bigger issue is the skags that'll spawn occasionally. Anyway, we take down Bloodwing, get the thing we need, and upgrade Claptrap. Now we gotta go find Breakout in Thousand Cuts and get through a hazing to join his gang. This is another section where ammo is a big issue, and in the interest of transparency and honesty, I did melee some enemies. This challenge had been testing my patience for a while, and this was my breaking point. I could have retried the section from the beginning, hoping to get better RNG, or went and farmed for more Iridium to get more pistol SDUs, or even farmed for a pistol stockpile relic. But this was my 10th play session. <laughs> and while I'm not gonna pretend like my time is valuable, I will pretend like my sanity is. This is the only section where I melee an enemy, or did any purposeful non-basic repeater damage. I just wanted to come clean with that. I could have easily edited around it, but good god. This challenge is rough. Afterwards, we have to destroy three beacons with Brick, and that just means we let another NPC do our job for us. After Brick finishes destroying the beacon, we head back to Sanctuary and get tasked with going to Opportunity and murdering a body double of Handsome Jack to get a pocket watch. This was probably the biggest roadblock of the entire run. Jack's body double is pretty tanky, even in the normal game. He has a shield which, when broken, regenerates itself partially, making the fight even more difficult. On top of that, we're in Opportunity, an area with nearly infinite loaders and Hyperion personnel. I tried many, many strategies here. I tried camping this ammo vendor and taking out all the enemies and luring Jack over. No good. Enemies respawn too fast, and even if I could lure Jack over to this vendor, he runs away after his shield breaks and calls for reinforcements. At some point, I actually ran out of money to buy ammo with, so I took a page out of Little Gas Mask's playbook and went to Wham Bam Island to farm the absolute shit out of this chest. It respawns, it's on level, it's close to the fast travel, it's literally perfect. Not only for money, but for any shields, class mods, and relics we might need. I farmed this chest for about 30 minutes, getting this vitality relic, a shield capacity and recharge rate relic, this calculating technophile class mod, and this pouncing turtle shield. Anything that wasn't useful I grabbed and sold, bringing me well over $100,000. Then, back to Sanctuary, getting more Anarchy stacks. I don't know how much of this playthrough was just stacking Anarchy in this one spot, but it was multiple hours. I tried again, and died. Getting frustrated, I decided to throw some spaghetti at the wall, doing different wacky things in an attempt to find a strategy that could work. One thing I found was sitting up in this section gave weirdly good cover, allowing me to pelt the body double from far away in relative safety. The only issue was that my backside was completely exposed, and I'm not gonna lie, this didn't work either. I think I tried this about five times before calling it and saying I'd need to level up. And so... I went to the beat, and grinded, and grinded, and grinded. I didn't bother recording it, since, you know, 500 gigabytes. 
and I have no clue how long it took. But at the end of it all, I was level 35. I was close to level 36, and my brain was becoming mush. With all of those levels, I could finally kill Handsome Jack's body double. One upside to this that I didn't even think about until after I killed the body double was that I was now on level for the items sold on the Digistruct Peak. I found this shield that had a relatively decent recharge delay and much better capacity. I also respect, and this is what my skills look like. Lots of survivability, mostly in health regen and max health. Now it's time to head up to the bunker. I figured I could skip this section of the area where you normally need to kill this constructor to get this door to open by doing a fancy double grenade jump, and it seemed to work. I got to these buggy Hyperion turrets, took them out very slowly, and made it to this badass constructor that will slowly kill itself over time if you just let him launch nukes over and over again. Not only does he damage himself, he also kills all of his own buddies. Very convenient. I make a mistake by going to grab ammo near him and end up dying for it. It took about 30 minutes to let the badass constructor nuke itself to death, but when it did... The door isn't opening. Why is the door opening? Why is the door open? Remember that constructor I skipped at the very beginning? The one that opens this door? Yeah. As it turns out, that's a necessary part of this mission. If you skip that, the badass constructor won't open the final door and you cannot progress. So, what's the solution? Well, we can't deal enough damage to the constructor to kill it, and there's no safe spot to hide from it and let it nuke itself to death. But, there is a somewhat obscure mechanic that we can abuse here. Did you know that you can shoot constructor's nukes out of the air? And, did you know that if you do it when the nuke is still close enough to the constructor, it'll deal self-damage? Yeah, so we just have to sit behind the constructor, far enough away so it doesn't use its fire AoE attack, but close enough that we can snipe the nuke right as it launches. This doesn't deal a lot of damage, but it's a hell of a lot more than what we do. So, I find a good spot, right behind this thing, and I wait, and wait, and wait. It seems like constructors launch nukes a lot more infrequently than their badass counterparts. This took about 40 minutes, from the constructor spawning to the moment the door opened. Next is more of the same. We get to the badass, sit behind its badass, and wait for it to slowly die of radiation poisoning. At some point, I started playing Bellatro since I still haven't gotten a Golden Stake win in that game. Still haven't, by the way. That shit is tough. Anyway, the Constructor dies, we book it for the bunker, and get ready for what will be the second longest fight of this entire run. Even just taking out the auto cannons before the fight takes 20 minutes. Thankfully, there's no ammo issues, as we can always just head to this ammo vendor and stock up with all the money we gain from farming Wham Bam Island. Now for the fight proper. Bunker is not a hard fight. Even when you're not 8 levels over leveled, this is a pretty slow and easy fight. There's plenty of cover, lots of space for you to move around in, and not a lot of adds to pester you. But we still only have the basic repeater to deal damage. Calculating the scaling difference between our level 1 damage and the level 28 boss's health, we get... <sighs> yeah. To put this in context, try to imagine taking on Bunker with an on-level basic repeater. Now imagine that same fight, but Bunker now has 43 and a half times more health. That's what I was doing. This fight took over an hour, and I actually ran out of money from needing to buy so much ammo. $100,000 down the drain. In fact, I had expended all of the ammo in the area, and Bunker still wasn't dead. But, one of the random bots died to the flying support buzzards, and dropped some pistol ammo, giving me just enough to kill the Bunker and progress the story. I picked up all of the weapons I could, reveling in the destruction I had wrought with what basically amounts to a slingshot. I sold all the guns, filled my ammo, and took the elevator down. Now, Control Core Angel is interesting for a few reasons. First, you can despawn Angel, which is just funny. It doesn't actually have anything to do with the run. But, when the section actually begins, three loaders spawn. Now, normally, Angel spawns in ammo crates during this section, but, and I didn't know this until now, she doesn't start doing it until you kill these first three loaders. 
Now, on my first try at this, I ran out of ammo. At this point, I had purchased all but one of the pistol ammo upgrades, so there was only one way I could possibly get more ammo capacity without somehow farming for a bunch more iridium, and that was with a pistol stockpile relic. So far, I hadn't found a single one in the entire playthrough. I went to Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep. There's a few chests you can access in the very beginning, and I spent about 20 minutes farming them and getting a white stockpile relic that boosted pistol and SMG max ammo by 23.5%. This was okay, and may have been good enough, but I knew I could get better. I farmed for another 10 minutes before deciding I would just roll with it. I went to Wham Bam Island to farm more money and found this on the first pull. You can't make this shit up. Back to Sanctuary, yada yada. I make the trek back to Control Core Angel, hoping to god I now had enough ammo to get past the first three loaders. Not only did I have enough, I took them down handily. I think I just got more criticals making the efficiency of my bullets much greater. We're now introduced to the second thing that makes this fight interesting for this challenge. These shock field generators. They electrocute you within a certain radius, but can be disabled if you deal enough damage. It takes a very long time, but since Angel is now actually helpful, it's only a matter of time. This section, in total, takes about two hours. And after a while, the Iridium Injectors start respawning. Not only do the Injectors respawn, they respawn in their invincible state. You might think this is just a funny detail, but no, this is a real problem. These Injectors become literally invincible if you take too long in this fight. Now this is obviously an oversight by the developers, and it's one I already knew about. This thing isn't really an enemy, so this grenade that for some reason is able to damage it is perfectly fine. Trust me. Angel decides to depart from this mortal coil, leaving us one last ammo chest to remember her by. Roland, not being able to take anything seriously, spills a bunch of raspberry jam everywhere, and going to clean himself off while Lilith gets kidnapped. Now we've gotta head to Novak through Nipton. I mean, Arid Nexus through Iridium Blight. But oh no, Jack locked it, oh no. Well, now we gotta head to everyone's favorite map, Sawtooth Cauldron. We hit the elevator, only to get ambushed by four shield nomads. This part is torture. Remember Bad Ma? Remember how long that took? Now imagine there's four of them. My strategy here was to sit in a spot where I could shoot them safely and shoot however many times it took to kill them. It was around right here that Shadow Evil raided my stream and everyone was immediately confused as to what I was doing and why. I really can't blame them. <laughs> it took an hour to kill all of the ambush commanders. One of the things I enjoyed about Spuddy Cube's video is how succinct it was. There wasn't a lot of unnecessary detail, and while that's really nice for viewing, it really doesn't capture how long and painful this run is. We do the grenade jump to skip some of the map, head to Boombringer, destroying it after an embarrassing amount of bullets, and take the elevator to the top. And before you ask, no, we did not kill Mortar. In this next section, we've got to kill five buzzards. This would be impossible if we had to do it all at once, but thankfully, we can kill one, go down the elevator, fill up our ammo, and go back up to kill the next one. This is another section that takes over an hour, since we really can't make use of anarchy here. Too little accuracy and we just can't hit the buzzards. Even close enough doesn't help since the ricocheted bullets don't account for enemy movement. From here, we basically just have to sprint to do every objective. Getting to the Arid Nexus, hitting the pump stations, busting the pipe open, finding Firestone, and downloading the location of the warrior. Finally, after all we've been through, we're on the very last mission of the game. We find Claptrap in Iridium Blight and follow him to this door. We need to defeat a few waves of loaders in order for Claptrap to open the door, and allow us to progress. Now you may think this is a simple task, and it is. You'd be right. I just got interrupted three separate times when doing this, and had to restart each time from the beginning. Even if you die in this section, the mission will keep track of how many enemies you've killed in the wave. 
allowing you to progress pretty easily. However, it doesn't keep track if you save and quit. The only issue is if you run out of ammo, you have to run back to the fast travel area to buy more ammo, which pretty much guarantees the enemies will respawn with full health. It all works out though, as long as you kill even a single enemy per ammo run. Finally, I was able to get an attempt without being interrupted. And after about an hour and 15 minutes, I died. But something weird happened. Reinforcements depleted. I guess the last loader despawned after I died, but since I had already damaged it, maybe the game counted it as killed. I genuinely don't know. But this saved me probably about 10 minutes, so I'm grateful. Heroes Pass is dangerous. If you take the intended path. We won't be doing that. We can bypass the first force field by literally just walking over this right area, then we bypass the second one with a grenade jump. This allows us to skip all of the fighting and head straight to the Vault of the Warrior. Now, I knew I would have to cheese Jack somehow. He's actually pretty tough and can deal a lot of damage with the things he spawns, but he's also very susceptible to being cheesed. If you block him from reaching a place he's programmed to interact with, he just kind of stands still. After you break his shield, he'll occasionally teleport to a nearby console and summon a surveyor that gives him a invincibility shield. The turrets he throws are actually dangerous, capable of shredding shields and putting a fire dot on you, and this kills me a few times. I was really questioning how feasible this fight was with conventional strategy when suddenly he just stopped moving. Yeah, I'm not even surprised at this point. AI in this game, in a word, is unique. I'll take the freebie. Now, I remember seeing in Spuddy Cube's video that they sat in this area and just shot at the warrior for several hours. I don't know about you, but I don't want to sit here for several hours. So I fought the warrior a little more head on. I got real up close and personal and figured out that the area on the warrior's chest actually takes more damage, even if you don't break it open. On top of that, after you break it open, it does the same amount of critical hit damage as if you hit its mouth. So that was my strategy. I sat in front of the warrior, jumped, and shot at its chest for an hour and a half. Admittedly, there were a few times where I accidentally did jumping damage because the warrior's attacks will cause your hitboxes to intersect, basically forcing it to happen if you're not prepared, but I didn't abuse this. At the end of it all, I took the warrior down. After 45 hours spread over two weeks, I was finished. <sighs> I really have to echo this sentiment. Don't do this challenge. It's not fun. It's not engaging. Even if you think you can do it more efficiently, and admittedly you probably can, it won't be worth the amount of time and effort it takes. I can only commend Spuddy Cube for getting through this entire game without breaking down a single time like I did during the slab initiation. So. Really, go watch their video if you haven't already, it's it's good. Bonus content time. So, after finishing the starter pistol only, I needed something different. Something cathartic, to make me forget about the hours of... this. So, what did I do? Did I... play some UVHM? Salvador? Maybe even a different game? Well, I decided to do the exact same challenge again. Okay, maybe not the exact same. You see, Earlier, I was playing the game on the current patch, the most up-to-date version of the game that had many glitches fixed. This time, I'll be doing starter pistol only, but with some revised rules. I'm now allowing glitches, and amp shields. I can summon Death Trap, but can't deal damage with him. And we will be playing on patch 1.1, so let's get started. To start off, everything is pretty much the same, except alongside my gauge, I also make an Axton. This is a secret tool that'll help us out later. We wake up in Windshear Waste, unequip all of our gearbox weapons, and head to get our gun. This time though, we'll be doing a glitch right off the bat. By swapping weapons, then interrupting that swap by opening the inventory, and using the inventory to swap the weapon's positions, you transfer the effects from the first weapon to the second weapon. It's basically as though you were holding both of the weapons at the same time. This glitch is called merging. In this case, all sniper rifles have an innate critical hit bonus, and we merge it into the starter pistol to transfer that effect. With this, we're able to easily clear the first section of the game. 
killing Knuckle Dragger. Since we don't have a good XP farm, we kill him a couple more times before moving on. We save Tutorial Town, meet Hammerlock, and grab the mission Bad Hair Day. This gives us another sniper rifle that I can merge into later. We hit level 5 on our way to Boom Boom, and you might have noticed that our pistol only has 7 shots instead of 10. I'm guessing doll pistol magazine sizes got buffed at some point, indirectly buffing the starter pistol, but I don't know. We get to Boom Boom and take him out fairly easily with our increased critical hit damage, hitting level 6. I save and quit to kill him a couple more times, reaching level 8, and move on to Captain Flint. Making my way up to Captain Flint, killing enemies is incredibly easy, so long as I hit them in the head. And since the critical bonus stacks with Anarchy, we're actually doing a reasonable amount of damage. We do the skip to the crane, and Claptrap doesn't get stuck again. Must be my lucky day. By the way, if Claptrap gets stuck for you here, just set your max FPS to 30. He'll fix himself. We jump into the Flint fight and immediately join him on his little platform. Captain Flint isn't easy to headshot since he has this face mask that blocks crits, so being up close or right behind him helps. We get knocked out of the arena, which is less than ideal, but it's just a minor setback. We kill Flint, head to Three Horns, Reese, Battery, Sanctuary, get our third weapon slot, which allows us to merge one more weapon into our basic repeater. Surprise, surprise, we merge the other sniper rifle we have. I go to Marcus to test how much damage we're doing on a critical hit now and the results are good. To put it into perspective, with 400 Anarchy stacks and no merging, we could deal 158 damage on a critical. Now, we're dealing nearly double that with only 150 Anarchy, and it only gets better from here. We go to Frostburn Canyon, clearing out enemies with gusto, and making our way to Lilith. While fighting with Lilith, we hit level 10, giving us another point of close enough. Clearing out the rest of the bandits is easy. We get back to Sanctuary and grab another pistol SDU, but we probably won't need that for long. Foreshadowing is a narrative device. We head to Three Horns Divide, honk our horn, go to the dust, and find a funny weapon, then quit out. Remember that Axton I made at the beginning of the run? Well, I was playing him for a while and just so happened to get him to the dust. How convenient! Maybe my Axton and Gage can play together and engage in some jolly cooperation. Now, this next footage is kind of weird because the video is from Gage's perspective, but the audio is from Axton's perspective. I didn't notice this until much later, so please forgive me. Anyway, Gage really likes popcorn. She loves it, in fact. But when she eats so much popcorn, her hands get all buttery. She just can't hold her guns. Okay, jokes aside. What I'm doing here is an off-host, multiplayer exclusive glitch called crit stacking. By swapping our weapons really fast and spamming the drop weapon key, the game incorrectly thinks we're holding guns that we aren't really holding. Each time you see a duplicate gun drop, that's another gun that the game thinks we have in our hands. If you think this is similar to merging, you're basically right, but the chief difference is that we can do this infinitely. It also transfers some more innate attributes of weapons than merging does, but that's not really important. What is important is that gun we picked up earlier, the Gwen's Head. It has a measly 38% critical hit damage buff, so why do we care about it? Well, this isn't just any crit buff. You see, there are two types of crit buff stats in Borderlands 1 and 2. Type A crit and Type B crit. I won't go into too much detail on this topic, but just know that Type A crit bonuses are multiplied by Type B crit bonuses. The sniper rifle bonuses that we got earlier are Type A crit. Guess what Type Gwen's head is? After some crit stacking, we now do over 300 damage on crit without any anarchy stacks. The only downside of this is that when you have multiple instances of the game open, it doesn't lock the mouse cursor in properly. I kept on accidentally clicking stuff on my second monitor whenever I turned fast. Anyway, we get 150 stacks of anarchy and head back to the dust. Unfortunately, bandit technicals don't have crit spots, so even with all of our insane critical hit damage, we still have to be reliant on our raw gun damage for this section. Takes a while, but we get there. Now it's time for Bad Maw. I take some more time to stack extra Gwen's heads, and this fight is a joke. We make our way through Bloodshot Stronghold, normally this time, and hit level 12. At level 12 we get an interesting skill, Buck Up. Remember when I said that I wouldn't allow Death Trap to fight enemies, but I would let myself summon him? Well, this is why. 
when you get buck up applied to you while transitioning to another area, the game doesn't ever stop applying the shield regeneration effect. You can force Death Trap to apply buck up to a player by just taking off your shield, meaning you can do this whenever you want. Not only that, but if you do this multiple times, the effect will stack. You see here, I throw a grenade at the ground, and my shield recharges without any delay. With more stacks, the recharge rate will be even faster. This is known as the buck-up glitch. I go back and forth between Bloodshot Stronghold and the Ramparts a few times before I finally get enough stacks that I think I'm ready. Now we're practically invincible, so long as nothing can damage us through our shields, and as long as an enemy has a crit spot, we can kill it. That doesn't mean this is free, though. Exploders can still break our shield and damage our health, and there are quite a few enemies that don't have critical hit spots. This is not an issue for now, though, as we make it to Warden and kill it in a few seconds. Also, I noticed a glitch here. Even though I was reloading an empty magazine, the game still occasionally dumps my anarchy stacks. I later posited that this was likely due to me spamming my mouse clicks and some weird desync happening between Gage, the client, and Axton, the host. Anyway, we save Roland and get back to Sanctuary. At this stage in the game, rocket launchers can now spawn in weapon vendors, and that is important. I look around for a Vladoff rocket launcher and find one pretty quickly, but it requires level 13, so what I want to do will have to wait. We get to Tundra Express, running through like a fleeting wind and grabbing the two Badonkadonks. We hijack a train, and this is when I realize that I've been capturing the wrong audio this entire time. Told you I'd fix it. Wilhelm is about as difficult as he'd be in a normal playthrough, and we get our payback for the hours he'd cost me. I go to turn in the mission and hit level 13. So, by equipping this Vladoff rocket launcher, shooting once, and swapping back and forth on it, we stack the effect of not consuming ammo every other shot that the Vladoff rocket launchers have on all of our weapons. That means we now have infinite ammo. Infinity Pistol, look out! We go to remove the power core, and- oh, oh, right, forgot about that. We get axed in here and remove the power core. Blah blah blah, city's on fire, and now it's flying. Now that I have infinite ammo, I bind my fire weapon key to scroll wheel down. This allows me to make full use of the basic repeater's 12.5 fire rate, turning it from a pistol into a machine gun. Plus, no more anarchy dumps from reloading. We get to the fridge, and I decide to do some of Fink Slaughterhouse for some experience. You'll notice I'm aiming at the ceiling and above enemies, so that when close enough procs, there's a decent chance the ricochet will hit their critical hit spot, their heads. We get to round three and head out. You know, we're doing okay damage, but it's only on crit. I need more basic gun damage. Oh yeah, amp shields. Amp shields give your gun bonus damage whenever they're full, expending a small amount of their charge. Since we've got a bunch of buck up stats that we've basically been getting every time we travel between areas, we pretty much always have full shields. Not only that, but all those crit bonuses we have, those apply to the amp damage as well. We kill the gluttonous thresher, clear overlook with ease, and get our fourth equipment slot. This doesn't change much now since Crit stacking is pretty much outclassed merging, but it's still something. Speaking of crit stacking, I do some more of that. Not actually for the crit, believe it or not. I just wanted to duplicate weapons for money. The crit is just a nice side effect. Now we head to the Wildlife Exploitation Preserve. This is the first time we see some enemies that are quite a bit higher level than us. With this much of a disparity, it's not unlikely that we might actually die. We get to the section with the super badass loader, and now's the real test of our damage. We take both of his arms off, but his stomp obliterates us. Lesson learned, don't get too close. We go down once more, but get the second wind on him, and progress over to Bloodwing. Here it is, Blood Ugh, God damn it. I make Axon take a long walk off a short pier, and get him to respawn next to us. And now we can fight Bloodwing. Our damage actually isn't that bad, all things considered, and if we get a crit, it's just no contest. I take the upgrade from Bloodwing's collar, and suddenly realize that the explosion will probably kill me if I stand too close. We get back, turn in the mission, and now it's off to Thousand Cuts. We finish the initiation, and now it's time for mortars. At the last mortar, I'm reminded yet again that all of my damage is coming from crits and shield amp. We finish the mission, recruiting Brick. I head over to Moxie's bar and tip her for a while. 
And luckily for me, she gives me exactly what I want. Well, it's a couple levels too high, but that's fine. I head to Lynchwood to get a level, ignore the quest. We head to Opportunity, kill the body double, get the voice samples, and we are out. <laughs> Remember like half an hour ago when I spent multiple paragraphs on that section? Good times. I grab the mission Mighty Morphin, and head over to the Caustic Caverns for some more XP. These mutated Vargids give very decent experience, and so long as you don't actually pick up the samples, you can make them infinitely. I hit level 20, meaning I can now equip the bad touch we got earlier. For the uninitiated, Miss Moxie weapons all have a lifesteal effect. For some weapons, the bonus is absolutely insane, like the Grog Nozzle. For the good and bad touch, it's just a small amount, but that's fine. All we need to do is stack the effect multiple times. Now, not only do we have a shield that's constantly recharging, but all damage we deal heals us for a substantial amount. I think we're ready to fight Bunker. Bunker actually took longer than I expected, but I understand why. You see, enemies with a higher level than you have an innate amount of damage resistance. One or two levels above you and the damage resistance is hardly noticeable, but when you're facing off against enemies that are six levels higher, you're gonna start feeling it. We get to Angel, despawn her, and something tells me we won't have any issues clearing this section in time on this run. Just a hunch. Angel dies, Roland dies, Lilith yada yada, story story. This is all cool. But what's really cool is that when we get back to Sanctuary, we grab this mission. Not useful yet, but it will be. We get to the Iridium Blight, the bridge is destroyed, and it's off to Sawtooth Cauldron. Nothing really of note happens here, except we grab Marcus's $9. Also, the audio cuts out here. This one I don't have an explanation for, it just kinda happened. We kill the buzzards, get the Y94 Odomo charges to blast open a path to the info stockade, and find the warrior. Thank you. Contact me at this web zone if you want to hire me for voice work. We travel back to Sanctuary to turn in the quest we got from Marcus, and get perhaps the most infamous weapon in Borderlands 2. Well, second most infamous. Not important now though, as we've got to head to the Arid Nexus. We overload the pubs, bust the pipe, and head to the Badlands. I also learned that this used to be a red chest. It's a white chest in the current patch. I wonder why. We get to the Badlands and grab the quest Uncle Teddy for another gun that'll do us some good. I used to know where all the echoes for this quest spawn, but I guess I lost my touch at some point. We turn that in for the Lady Fist. I kill a bunch of extra enemies for much needed experience, and for anyone who is disappointed we didn't fight Saturn in the first playthrough, despair no more. Now Saturn doesn't actually have a crit spot, so we can't demolish it the way I wanted, but we can take him out in only 4 minutes. So I'd call that a win. We find the location of the warrior, and head back to Sanctuary. I want to be level 25, so I spend some time farming this level 28 Vandal for experience. We hit level 25, and now, if you had any doubts we were overpowered before, allow me to dispel that. This is the Evil Smasher. It is a terrible assault rifle. It's got bad damage, poor fire rate, a small magazine, and slow moving projectiles. But each time you reload it, there's a chance you'll proc a special effect, giving you a huge buff to many of your gun stats. Now, when you reload, swap weapons, then swap back, the amount of times this buff can occur stacks. I have no words. We're now doing damage that would be insane for level 61 the max level in this patch of the game. Needless to say, we breeze through Hero's Pass and get to the Vault of the Warrior. It's here where the audio issue fixes itself somehow, and we can finally hear the somber sounds of... Alright, and here he is, Jack the Big Bad Bo- oh. Well, at least there's the Warrior. Alright, here it is, Warrior, the ultimate weapon- okay, wow, oh. Well. Given all I'd suffered through before this, I'd say this was earned, as was this Impaler. I summon Death Trap, allowing him to get the final blow on Jack as a way to send us off, but he just stands there. He knows that wouldn't be the proper way. And so, we finish off Jack with the only weapon that we needed, the only weapon we'll ever need. And just to prove it, we're going to kill Terramorphus. This was an insane journey from pulling my hair out in the beginning, to the feeling of utter satisfaction from killing all the bosses with ease. 
I can only say that, well, I can't recommend doing this challenge on current patch. Doing it on patch 1.1 with glitches was actually decently fun. I hope you enjoyed the video. And even if you didn't, I hope you learned something new. Feel free to like, subscribe, and all that stuff. And enjoy this footage of me killing Terramorphus with the level 1 basic repeater.
Bonus, bonus content. This is what it looks like when you crit stack the bane. And this is what it looks like when you kill Tyromorphus with it. See ya. Pretty much force you to deal jump damage. Jesus Christ. Force you to deal um lodge themselves into you and force you to deal jump damage. And force you to deal jump damage. That's a fucking tongue twister and a half.